Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network Room Week in Review for March 24, 2024. Today we're talking with Tevan Borosyan. Hello, Tevan. Welcome to the show. Welcome to you, Tevan. Hello, Aspet. Hello, Hovik. Thank you for having me once again. Hey, everyone. Before we get going here, let me remind you to support us to help us expand our reach. Go to our donate page, podcasts.groong.org slash donate, and consider buying us a coffee. Or better yet, become a sustaining member of Groong with a monthly contribution. We are going to keep going as we have for years, but we are stronger with your support than without. podcasts.groong.org slash donate. Thank you, and on with the show. So, Tevan, on Friday night, four terrorists attacked a concert hall in Moscow called the Crocus City Hall. At present, the death toll stands at 137 and is expected to rise. The gunmen opened fire on the audience and set the building on fire, and also atrocities were committed. The Islamic terrorist group ISIS claimed responsibility for the attack, but details remain sketchy. On Saturday, President Putin declared that the four gunmen were apprehended as they fled towards Ukraine and claimed that an escape window was prepared for the gunmen across the border in Ukraine. After the questioning, the gunmen reportedly confessed to be Dajigs who had transited through Turkey before reaching their destinations. At present, there are also reports that earlier in March, the U.S. had warned Russia of a potential strike and warned its citizens to avoid crowded areas until further notice. And also, one final interesting thing in this story that connects it to the Armenian angle, the TV media outlet called TV Rain, Dojd, which is operated from exile and declared a foreign agent in Russia, quoted an anonymous eyewitness who claimed that the attackers spoke to each other in Armenian. The TV station later apologized for this mistake in the wake of the Dajik terrorist confessions, which put Turkey squarely in the limelight of Russia's scrutiny. So as far as we know, there was actually an Armenian victim in this terrorist attack as well. The question here is, where did this Armenian story come from on Dost? What do you think is going on here? Uh, I would divide your question on two parts. Well, one is the terrorist attack and the second is uh, Armenian part. Let me start with the terrorists. I think in reality, there is an issue with the Russian behavior. Traditionally, for something important, they are getting ready. And when it's passing, they immediately relax. And I think we're taking into account like U.S. information about that they warned the Russians. It has been before election. Let's not forget it, that it's one week. It's seven days. And they warned them 10 days ago. And which meaning that all these issues has been really prepared and orchestrated, maybe to have something during or on the last day or in the previous day of elections, trying to create a non-startup situation or the problematic situation in Russia. But it didn't work. And because there was a payment, because there was a planning of data, organizers, I think, utilized this traditional Russian behavior that now all Russians consider that elections passed, let us relax, let us enjoy the life, go to concert, you know, drink, and so on. And this brought to the situation when the attack has been triggered. The utilizers of unstable situation in any countries, there is always exist. Uh, there is always a confrontation between various countries. That's why each country's uh, situation being destabilized some other countries would be interested in. And I think the Russia has gained so many enemies now that many countries would be just uh, immediately enjoying. Ukraine has been really happy with this and start various attacks. Many other countries would be really uh, immediately putting all this situation into their benefits. And the situation was really moving, in my view, in this direction. And I think taking into account all this part, we can say that it has been much easier to organize the situation in Russia with taking their traditional way. Uh, I think Hovik would understand me much better because knowing also Russian, uh, Russian avoids, avoids pavizot. That's why let's uh, police will not do its work, let's special services will not do its work, let's and not pay really serious attention to many issues. Elections passed away, everything is perfect. Let's enjoy our life. 
But in reality, I think everything has been planned for the totally different event, for much earlier attacks. Just it's, this was a situation to try to utilize. And the situation has been triggered. And after that, we're having a traditional, again, Russian behavior. Very quickly, all, everyone has been caught, organized, or the guys who really uh, shoot the stuff uh, starting to break bad. Russia is Russia. And I do believe that many countries immediately start to think how to clean up their engagement and involvement. One of them is Turkey. So if the U.S. had warned Russia about these terrorists, how could these people have transited through Turkey and not been apprehended? And then also, how could the Russian intel miss this situation? Again, I'm saying that I don't think that uh, there wasn't been everything checking much seriously, not on the catching the guys, but on the organizational sides, where's to fulfill before election. As election passed away, everyone relax. Now, the uh, U.S. warning, it's again, when U.S. is warning its enemy, Russia, for something, it means they planning something. And the special services always even taking into account some warnings, they're doing their totally different situation. I think the same with U.S. U.S. perfectly also knows about attacking 2001, September 11, but never pay attention to uh, how it will be fulfilled. About the immediate comment that uh, these people may have been speaking uh, in Armenian with each other. Do you think this is a mistake between uh, people who don't no, understand no, 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 that no, they no. speak Armenian versus Tajik or somebody was opportunistically no, dropping no. A propaganda against Armenians? This is, this is opportunistically and spe specifically orchestrated by the same countries who have been engaged in the processes of organization. I do believe it's Turkish Azerbaijani payment for getting it to this part because they perfectly know that there is a, some tense situation between Russia and Armenia. And why not to utilize it for their benefits? Why not to really go for this and try to put that there is various, various tells of the situation that it wouldn't be only any terroristic organization is like with the Islamic side, but also with the Armenian side. Some guys get a good money. Maybe it even has been in their mind, come and offer to their sponsors. That, guys, if you will pay us additional money, we will make an Armenian tale to this story and try to earn some more profit of their work. Because yeah, everyone I don't tries think... to capitalize from the situation. Yes, uh, yes, and uh, be it even on the personal level. Why you think that guys at the doors don't following what is the really going on the propaganda issues and out of which issues possible to earn more additional money? And I wouldn't be really thinking that it hasn't been a personal idea. Uh, let's call to my sponsor, be it in Baku sitting or sitting in Ankara. And ask them, like, guys, let us also put the Armenian scenario to this and raise that it has been Armenian speakers. Because when they're saying that anonymously, you can say that I even heard the Zimbabwean language. But there is no Zimbabwe-Russian tense relations. There is Armenian-Russian, which could be presented as the real story. In any way, I'm very glad that as of this moment, guys who has been really doing Terroristic attacks are cash though. Now the ISIS is accepted that they are, it has been their operation. The most funny thing out of all this element is that, that there wasn't been any demands towards it. This has been just simply killings. It has been yeah. just simply murder without any like freedom to someone or do something like this. And I think it's becoming very modern now to do something bad to just destabilize the situation without ever putting any proper demand and even the terrorism changed uh, in its views in the way it's implemented yeah i just uh, would like to say that we uh, of course express our condolences to all the victims but my personal opinion you know i always try to go after the key bono who who benefits from this and to me also this 
highlights the vulnerability of Russians to these types of attacks, whether they're for religious fanatics, terrorism, or actually your enemy trying to infiltrate and cause terrorism. Equally bad that it wasn't caught. And, uh, you know, as an Armenian, I think that if Armenia ever stopped being the uh, wedge in between the Turkic world, maybe Russia would see more of this. Uh, I'm not sure, but I don't want to capitalize on that situation. Uh, you know, indeed, it's you a know, horrible, well, it, horrible situation. What is very interesting is that, first of all, this is shows, as you said, that the weak sides of the uh, Russian behavior and maybe their life in the capital or in big cities. I think now will be the time for learning. I don't know, Russian special services would be learning much more on this or their enemies would be earning on the, this like uh, spots which possible to utilize in future or something like this. But as I said, that the scenarios of this game is uh, really maybe not the event in reality, but what would be happening after that. In Turkey today, they arrested some 40 guys from ISIS. And now Turkey would be selling this like they supporting and cooperating with Russia. U.S. has been saying that they've been warning Russia about possible terrorist attacks or inform them, which meaning that finally if they would be needed, U.S. can see like how I can be engaged in this if I have been warned. UK special services would be doing their part. All others, right. would be. it's a very difficult and check style, logic style game, which maybe only in a, some months would be really to understand uh, what was this and who, who get more, much lessons on this. Today, okay. Russia said that uh, some of their uh, other companies make stronger their security institutions, how the life would be there. But in reality, it's, it's a really pity. 139 deaths, really condolences to all of the relatives and families. It's the lives of kids, women, and the way how Takis has been very brutal because the old videos which has been there, this is just simply has been a place to come and kill the guys. I think even in Hollywood movies, sometimes you... you Editors yeah. are much, much human than the way There's our not enough imagination. Implemented. Yeah. yeah. So this is order. They burned something and the guys who has fleet to toilets or some other closed rooms has been out of air and died because yeah. of the fire and not even shooting. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really painful situation, but it shows uh, a lot of things. The most important that if the Russia would be able to learn something out of this or what kind of a new second front would be open. Yes. See, like West has been trying to open up second front in by Georgia. Georgians has been many times saying, no, we didn't going to do. Or sometimes uh, has been pushed for something in Armenia. But now it uh, would be that Russia now need to really put its uh, a lot of forces special services and everything on showing that they are going after the organizer, catching them, which meaning it's, it is taking their attention from the Ukrainian front. We'll see how this, uh, to see how the real game is planned with this in the future. Okay, let's move to the growing list of political prisoners in Armenia. Uh, two podcasters, Narek Samsonian and Vazgen Sagatelian, were arrested Saturday morning from their homes in one of the most brutal ways possible. Uh, and it was all streamed live. An entire law enforcement squad, some in civilian clothing, while others in uniforms and face masks, smashed Narek Samsonian to the ground, pushing his face on the uh, wet ground, essentially. Again, both of them were arrested from their homes, and they did not appear to resist the arrest. Even some of the Moscow terrorists seem to have received a less violent treatment. So what was their crime? Terrorism? Murder? Rape? Corruption? It just so happens that on their podcast, which is critical of Pashinyan, which is also getting extremely popular nowadays, you know, they sometimes use not so pleasant language, I'm sure, for Pashinyan. And we have to wonder what triggered Pashinyan. Was it when they called him son of a bitch? I'm not sure, but... Uh, yes, that is uncouth, and unfortunately, 
For Pashinyan, speech has been decriminalized in Armenia. You know, he tried to criminalize it, but he had to undo that after EU complaints. So later in that day, when the authorities provided clarification and the so-called smoking gun evidence, they referred to this podcast without naming it, but essentially referring to the time period within the podcast. We weren't able to find anything in those segments uh, that was criminal of nature. Of course, we're not uh, law enforcement, but we found a lot of calling a spade a spade, if you may. So officially, though, it seems that they're charged with hooliganism, apparently conducted via YouTube. You know, many uh, in the West are not familiar with the crime of hooliganism uh, in ex-USSR. Uh, essentially, it involves some kind of disturbing of public order. If, you know, you uh, shout insults to someone in a stadium and they are not, you know, it's not their choice to be there, but they heard those or you cause you cause a disturbance, you cause a beating and they are witness to that. It, it disturbs social decorum. So apparently the prosecutors and defense attorneys were arguing that day whether uh, YouTube viewers had the agency to simply change the channel that they're reviewing or whether this was essentially public disorder that they were forced to witness. So, Tevan, I don't know how much you uh, know Armenian law, but, you know, in your opinion, how can public order be disturbed by a YouTube live video? Oh, uh is it about video or is it about political uh, repression in Armenia? If it's about political repression in Armenia, doesn't matter. You say it just simply you are donkey or you use non-socially accepted language in Armenian way. If uh, they need to put you in a prison, they will do it. Uh, I remember July 2021 after elections. On one of my interviews, people said that, what is your prediction? What would be happening in Armenia? I said that the lost government would be bringing a new losses, and one of the process would be uh, repression. We just seen it. It's a logic of bringing fear to society. If tomorrow they would need it, just even they can use this, maybe aspect would be a bit secure staying in U.S., but for you and me, they can even say that our this discussion uh, was violation of something, and we both would be arrested. They just simply shows that uh, there is no any point of this. Yeah, someone is coming and saying that Silis Narek personally use bad words towards your parents. If he would be in a kind of a mood, okay, let's this time try it, take it differently. Uh, Narek can. Uh, Vasgen would be arrested. And it's happened. Narek Myland was the same. Armen yes. Ashutan is the same. Just the different cases. Tevan, you're talking about the government doing whatever it wants, but what about all these NGOs, these so called civil society, non government organizations that are constantly Aspect, raising uh, I, their I'm voice? Really, I'm really sorry, but let's say that it has been a very big mistake on Armenia previously that we have a civil society. And when I've been many times saying that in Armenia, we have a civil society of USAID, civil society of Soros Foundation, civil society of German foundations, civil society of EU, I mean, this is now we just simply present. There's no organizations which will be paid by the Armenian foundations purely with the sovereign origin of Armenia. Yeah. And then all these organizations are doing whatever they, for what they paid. I am not in a position and not you and not anyone in this world to change the natural laws, the laws of physics, of nature or something like that. The one who is paying, that guy is ordering the music. Right. They now need, the payers need that Pashinyan would be getting into the agenda of giving up everything to Azerbaijan on being there to fulfill the signed agreements and going against so-called destabilizing and bringing up anti-Russian moods. So everyone would be just keeping their service because mm -hmm. they have been getting that, guys, we have paid for you for something else. Previously, they've been saying that we're paying for you, that they will, you will raise your voice 
fight for human rights and so on. I'm sorry, where was your all that so-called civil societies when 120,000 people from Nagorno-Karabakh has been passing through genocide? They were busy making anti-Iranian videos. Okay, then then you you have your answer. And now they are busy with something else. Now then as where all of this so-called honest civil society organizations when they have hearing that for example there was people who paid to the election campaign without knowing that on their behalf there was some money. This is a criminal case. Yes. Do do, do you know any case there? Where are all of these people when they saying that previously the any service that government is buying should go through tenders and process of open competitions? And now you can see that uh, the best uh, component of that law against which they previously yelling is the best instrument go and buy immediately directly from someone else. Yeah. When it's it's not only simply issues of real this political violence. Even on the small stuff, they are not raising the issues because they they having a one propaganda that now Armenian to give up anything to Azerbaijan and uh, become yeah. under Just the yesterday, I believe two days ago, Daniel Ioannisian was uh, on public TV arguing about why we should be giving up those uh, four villages. The, so... the, the, the similar ca- cases, see, like, during the argumentation, the other friend saying that, guys, there is a security issue. It's the best, strongly prepared part of the border of Armenia. Until you haven't done anything, you cannot have a change because your enemy is Azerbaijan. But now the, what they're saying, let us be weak, let us lose more, and maybe one day international society community will have pity for us, this, right? Yeah, would start to demand from Azerbaijan, maybe in a 100-year time, when Azerbaijani gas and oil would finish. And Azerbaijan would also lost their interest into the eyes of the uh, so-called international community. They would remind that, oh my God, this this was Armenian uh, land. Why you are not giving? Uh, but after one hundred years, I don't. Yeah, except know there that. won't be any Armenians left there. Yes, yeah, see, like uh, the same with case with genocide. How much international community has raised their genocide issues, and when they start to recognize? It has been closer to the 100 commemoration dates. It has been uh, already no one alive to go into any demands towards yeah. Turkey. And then the Germany accepted. I don't know. Some other except the U.S. even accepted this part. Yes. Uh, and this is uh, what is there. What has been utilized out of the U.S. Congress decision on this? What has been utilized out of the German Bundestag uh, statement? or France even, uh, or any, uh, or the same Russia, that doesn't matter. The whole yeah. international community have the same uh, hypocritic behavior on all the issues. Until there is interest, no one would be utilizing. And if you're looking the words of Daniel Leonisian or something, this is just continuation of Nikol Pashinyan's so-called red color dress with the bulls uh, situation. Yes which is an allegory, uh, which making it fun. Because when it's a show on Motador fighting Google or something like this, it's a show. When it's sport, it's sport. But when it's life and your homeland, you are not judging in a sport or concert or show. Yes. You're doing everything for your grandkids. And now, guys, if... I'm thinking about my next two, three, four, five, ten thousand generations before and how I can say that let's lose us security line, which is already we have. And, and uh, instead of making it stronger, we're saying let's give it to the enemy. And later on, we do. Or Adrani Kochara saying that we need to learn, be united and live without a gas. We are without with Russian the gas. Uh, yes, like, uh, guys, if you understand that you need to be united for something national, then what was the whole divisions? Yes. 
Isn't been the same similar logic that you need to be united to have a patriotic war? You need to be united to build a strong economy. You need to be united to have a strong Armenia. Hey, and man, only uh, now you understand this part when you lose everything and lost everything. When there is no country, or as Lincoln say, international relationship is like a, uh, having a dinner. But just difference, you are sitting at the table or you are on the table meal. Right. Armenia is a on the table meal for already a long time, and that's why yeah. uh, nothing uh, uh, strange. So, like every day, there is a one new artificial topic invented in, into our agenda. We're discussing these artificial topics, forgetting about the most important one how to make Armenia again uh, the person who. Hovig, let's just take a moment here. We'd like to remind everyone to go to our donate page, podcasts.groom.org slash donate, and consider buying us a coffee or two, or better yet, become a sustaining member of Groom and give monthly. You know, we like to believe that we are unique in the category of Armenian podcasts. We digest Armenian news weekly and bring you interesting discussions relevant to it. We've always been a labor of love. And we're not only non-profit, but we're also non-budget. Just two to three friends who have committed our life's time and effort to understand the world around the Armenians and sharing that understanding with you. Of course, we will continue our work as we always have, but we are stronger with you than without you. Your support will help us expand our reach to more people who are interested in Armenian news and affairs around the world. So please visit our donate page, podcasts.groom.org slash donate and consider supporting us. Thank you in advance. We appreciate your listening to us and take that trust and your support very seriously. Thank you. Uh, Tevan, going back to the political prisoners issue, uh, you mentioned Narek Malyan. I wanted to say this because this, there was news last week. So Narek Malyan, for those that don't know, is an opposition activist. He faces harassment from the government through frivolous prosecutions and pretrial detention. One of his cases, for which he's in detention now, involves his Facebook posts following the handover of Artsakh after the one-day war in September 2023. Another case, the Ceausescu case, saw him being charged for public costs for violence because he staged a so-called futuristic execution uh, of Ceausescu. You know, he was the Romanian dictator who got executed uh, along with his wife. So for staging a reenactment of that incident, he was dragged through Armenian courts. Um, the initial court exonerated him in 2023. So after about more than a year in court, he was exonerated, but that was not enough for the prosecution, and they appealed that. And this week, the Court of Appeals upheld that exoneration. So out of the two cases against Malian, one is now gone. And the only one remaining is about something he said on Facebook, which makes it very similar to Narek Samsonian and uh, Vazgen Saratelian. Essentially, they're all being held. Their liberties are being deprived because of what they said. Uh, now, I can imagine anyone who yeah, has a normal job. It, it, it is uh, similar to all cases. The same yes. way as Armen No, So, you know what? I, it, I, I agree. The same, because he, he, he said something. Because he yeah. said something. In reality, I agree with you. But uh, yeah. what we hear frequently when we talk to, for instance, Western ambassadors, right? When we ask about cases, well, you know, it may be corruption. He's officially charged with corruption. But here is irrefutable proof that the entire crime occurred on Facebook. So they cannot bring up, they cannot ignore this by brushing it under the carpet with the corruption claims. But yet, despite all this, have, have we heard a single Western ambassador? No. Claim that there is a political. There's one political prisoner in Armenia. No, you, you will not be hearing it until the interest of West is lying with the policy of what is Pashinyan trying to implement. Right. You're checking now the all ratings. Remember, in at the end of 2018, 2019 has been much more popular on the government. Each this Thursday, government meetings uh, said that uh, Armenia gets up on the rating by economists or, I don't know, by the Heritage Foundation in this freedom line, in this part or something. Now it's, uh, in all that places, Armenia going down, or really making much uh, worse situation with its uh, previous even uh, ratings. 
because we're moving to dictatorship. But as Azerbaijani dictatorship was much great for the West, why it should be Armenian dictatorship less uh, acceptable for them? Yeah, because whenever we comparing, guys, with whom I can need to compare? Should I go with the, I don't know, compare with any other country than just by uh, the neighbor or by enemy? If it's okay for Ali, why it's not okay for Pashinyan? Dictator is dictator and West is perfectly working with them. No problem. And the most important that interest of West in the region are satisfied. Oil is coming, gas is coming, doesn't matter even oil and gas are Russian, but it's coming through Azerbaijan. It's perfect. We will uh, work on this. And uh, second, Russia is losing its positions in the of Caucasus. It's even greater. Good, do it. Support. We will support. The moment when, when, for example, finally it will not work, you will see how in one day all the same Western diplomats would go to the courts and participate in the court's decisions as they done previously. When the Sersaxian has been putting some guys into the prison in same uh, way, trying to say that we're coming to defend the guys. Remember Vartanos Kanyan case. That's all. Nothing is really changing. Just we are not learning the lessons in our history. This is the problem. But now, yes, our army is moving towards the dictatorship. And all these cases are to bring the fear before even bigger losses for Armenian statehoods. Okay, speaking of bigger losses, Pashinyan was in Tavush last week, and he didn't forget to take with him this now famous plastic cutout of Armenia. And, uh, you know, everybody has been using it. For the fun of it, we put a picture of this thing in our show notes. So if you want to see what we're talking about, click on the show notes. And also for those listeners who love Hobig and me inserting our own opinions and editorial comments in the show, I'll just say that he might as well have taken an Armenia made of Swiss cheese because he's putting more holes in our country than the Swiss put in the cheese. Anyway, he spoke to the residents of the four villages for over three hours, and Pashinyan's team finally edited the video into segments that were no more than 30 or 40 minutes, and apparently all of the controversial and contentious stuff was removed. During the meeting, he told the villagers that Armenia will receive a strong quote, invisible wall of legitimacy, unquote, and that there will be war by the end of the week. This would be this past weekend, by the way, by the end of the week, if we don't cede these villages. And he also said that if the war was allowed to happen, then the outcome was a foregone conclusion. There were also some media reports. We don't have video on this, but they reported that uh, he also raised the specter of Turkey attacking Armenia from the east in tandem with Azerbaijan. What are the risks of Armenia pulling back from these territories that Pashinyan wants to give away? Exactly what is this wall of legitimacy that he is talking about, Tevan? Can I just also ask something? I mean, what kind of a leader tells his people that we will lose a war? It's a foregone conclusion and we must give and give and give. I just thought <laughs> that, is, that is an even more basic question that I, I would yeah, like to know. It, it's not leadership. It's not leadership at all. Uh, guys, just let me say that. I never would be much clever, generous in simplicities. And I never would be much more generous than Monte Melbourne. If we lose Artsakh, we'll be turning off the last page of Armenian statehood history. We're just in that process. I don't know how many times to repeat it. We don't have a country as a state, a statehoodness. That's why to discuss what kind of a leader say what, you know, he's just preserving his chair. That's why for this regard, for not having much more, in his view, uh, losses with the thesis or with the fight, he is trying to do his best, go and tell, uh, let's give up, let's give up, let's give up. And that's all. It's not about what Armenia will be losing or what will be gaining. Nothing. The war would be in any way. The military action would be taking place. And it's not end. It's not only Tausch. Azerbaijan would be going for, in its view, in its uh, understanding, for its all enclaves and Zangezur corridor, as they say. That's why, guys, it's it's a, just part of the game, small part of the game. 
to bite from here, to bite from there, to bite from there until the good time would come to bite the whole army. Yeah. Turkey engagement? Yes, why not? If the process would start, who said that Turkey would be supporting Azerbaijan? Well, but how to make a fear on local level to bring the fear? You you cutting some political activists as a political prisoners on the bringing the whole national fear. You're talking about the enemies will come and kill all, all of us. But the enemies would be doing this uh, part. And that's why we're sometimes trying to find an, something over which would give us some hope. That you see, like I can do nothing, sit in my kitchen, have a dinner, and say so that, oh my God, such a bad case. And whenever even we're saying we're, we're looking for the new uh, leaders, we don't like old one or the, something like this, it's again to take the responsibility to others. And why not? Let's put the responsibility on the inhabitants of that four villages to say that because they try to uh, stand up in their villages and live there and fight for this, they are the ones who is a problem of the loss. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. believe me, to my words, the moment when Azerbaijan would in any way attack and try to get them, this would be the part. You cannot anymore to put the problem or the whole issue on previous regime, on corrupt staff, on uh, Russia and Moscow, or on someone else. Now would be the part of that four villages. Or the, anyone from the national forces who has been saying that we need to go and fight. And what is, has been very nicely orchestrated also, there was a group of Armenians who tried to say that we're going to defend that villages, and they've been arrested on the half of the way. Yeah, Marta can get by it soon. And yeah. today they, they've been all free, and so that it's happened that they've been going there without arms. <laughs> But they've been arrested because of the suspicion that they have arms. Guys, if you have suspicion and even stop them, stop the citizens of Republic of Armenia on the uh, roads of Armenia. Even they said that we're going to defend these villages. Freedom of movement is a right part of the human rights and also rights of Armenian citizens. You're stopping yeah. the bus, you're stopping the car, you're checking. There is no guns. Why are you arresting them? So that's okay, sorry. Please pass away, okay, uh, for, you stop me for 15 minutes, for 20 minutes, for one hour, check me. I don't have a gun. Why are you uh, then stopping me and let me continue? That's why I can see, see think that it has been very nicely orchestrated situation with this group of arresting them, keeping for one day, and then uh, it's happened that they all freed because there's no guns, and I don't know what's happened. Just to show that for anyone who would be trying to go and defend this part, would they be, would be arrested? But Tevan, isn't this all indicative of the tensions in the country rising because of all this fear mongering that's being done by Pashinyan? I mean, that this was not the single incident in the country. There was another incident in Nornork where three gunmen attacked the police station, and you know uh, that was okay. a different thing. But it shows to me that the, the the tension of the people is kind of boiling over at this point. Uh, as but the moment when it would be like in Russia, real killing, maybe I would be agreed. But until this is orchestrated points uh, in reality from the point that, because if I'm really with the high tension, I'm beating, I'm fighting. I'm putting a fuel on me and burning myself. There are these cases, Czechoslovakia, remember. There was a young guy who, but who really fueled him and burned him. Like the, anyone who has been really raising without control, they have been arrested and becoming political prisoners. And we have many cases of this. But it's not the moody society. It's not, it's not the real situation there. The government is feeling them yet very well. And they're trying to still control all the situations. Is there a field for this to go? Could be some possibilities, yes. But it's still the glass are not full and drop our drop is coming. It's happened that Artsakh is not uh, really a whole glass. Artsakh was uh, just drop. 
Now, Taush, that four villages would be another drop, another drop. And they, what they trying to do, that the glass never would uh, become full. And unfortunately, it seems like historically, when you're looking back, it's, it's a problem with our behavior for the whole our life. Uh, from the Tigran, the great time, we're having now the smallest Armenia ever. Even we haven't been having a statehoodness, but Armenia or area of where Armenia has been living has been always much bigger than now is having Armenia. Let's move on. We will cover these um, events. We will try to get to the bottom of what happened at the police station. We will try to get to the bottom of who indeed these people were, the 40 people who were arrested, uh, the so-called Yechbay Rusun. You know, we have some names that are uh, popping up that essentially indicate that these are previously, at least in the past, have been pro-Pashinian forces, but I will not, you know, make a judgment on that. I just wanted a quick comment from you, Tevan, on the past week's visit by Jens Stoltenberg. Uh, he toured all of South Caucasus, starting from Baku, then Tbilisi, and then Yerevan. In Baku, he talked about you know NATO security partnership with Azerbaijan, completely ignoring the sham elections that just happened there, completely ignoring Artsakh, the rights of Artsakhsis, you know the ethnic cleansing that happened, and in Tbilisi. Uh, he continued talking about partnership with uh, with NATO, strong anti-Russian rhetoric. And in Yerevan, I believe his anti-Russian rhetoric was the strongest. He said that Russia must not be allowed to win in Ukraine. Uh, he praised Pashinyan. He said he's enamored at how Pashinyan is leading the country and democracy, peace, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I summarized that, but do you have anything to add to Stoltenberg's visit? What was the purpose you know, how did the messaging differ uh, based on your interpretation and the overall strategy of the West and NATO? Was this part of it? First of all, to understand what is the Secretary General position of NATO is the person who need to speak with the 29 countries and he can pronounce right and make a statement only when the all 29 countries agreed that this is the most important point for them. Now, out of these 29 countries, there's also one country which named is Turkey. Now, Stoltenberg went to Azerbaijan, definitely tried to please whatever the Turkey would be there. NATO partnership, blah, 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 all these parts, strong security, uh, gas, oil, and everything. Uh, naturally, that all that messages were there. With the Georgia, yes, guys, we promise one day you would be part of the NATO, but it's not yet still time. But we are very good that you're doing with the European side and blah, blah, blah. Again, whatever the whole common Western dispositions could be happening. And for our needs also. He just simply fulfilled the instructions of that all countries, what they now need to say here. And that's why about Putin and Anti Russian, all the messages, what's happening in Armenia, trying to show this. If he is so much praising uh, Nikol Pashinyan, I wishing Stoltenberg, that is also as a nationality, it's also has a citizenship, I'm wishing him the same leader for his own country because he's praising, yes. But let his own country would get the similar guys who would lose the war who would lay later on give the part of territories of his countries to the neighbors, to his enemies, like to Russia or something like that. Yeah. This would be really uh, then a positive word because he's praising the way how is this management happening. But whenever you're speaking about Stoltenberg, it's not the personality. Maybe on the personal level in his kitchen with his wife and kids, he's been taking saying that, you know, it's such a bad stuff that on my part, being a NATO secretary, there were so many conflicts we have been losing, there have been crisis. But he's not in a shoes of secretary general. He need to pronounce only the points which is allowed by the all the other countries. That's why for me, it's a collective position. What is the policy of yes. in Armenia going against Russia and try to go like this? And it's a really good lose to. Anything and Turkey is the most important part of our region. And that's why pro-Turkish positions or pro-Turkish policy having a country, it's perfect. 
Great. And dictatorship that is grow, uh, raising in Armenia, it's a cold democracy. In Azerbaijan, as you said, it, no touching very funny election. With the dictatorship, let be there. We don't need a democracy. The most important, gas and oil. And your Turkish br- brother would ask us to behave in Azerbaijan in this uh, way. And in Georgia, whatever they uh, traditionally greet and said, praised and said that it's okay, do a bit more reforms, try to have much higher record on cooperation with the security issues. One day, maybe something would happen and Georgia would be part of the NATO, but you know, you need to resolve all your conflicts with the neighbor alone. That's why let's forget about Abkhazia, let's forget about other things. They are perfect. Listen and behave how the Turkey is running the policy. You, you know, in any way under the Turkish influence. That's all. That's why turning into the NATO Secretary General into something that it could be different. No, we have been seeing many visits of NATO secretaries. Lord Robertson, I think, has been the first one uh, still visiting in back in 2000. After that, there was also many time cases uh, when Armenia and NATO uh, initiated cooperation under the IPAP and some other issues. That's why it's not the first time, but we need to always know. Institutionally, NATO Secretary General could only speak not as an independent guy, not independent policy, but the collective policy of 29 countries. If one country is not agreed, will not happen. And that's why anything that it said, it's agreed to Turkey. That's why you can say that it has been a promotion of the Turkish policy. In Turkey. Well, uh, next week uh, we will talk about, we didn't get a chance to talk about it today, but next week we'll talk about Pashinyan's continuing love affair with EU. Uh, he went to the nuclear energy summit in Brussels. And also there's an upcoming meeting in Brussels with the guy overseeing the massacre in Ukraine, Blinken and his lady counterpart von der Leyen also overseeing the massacre in Gaza. And they're going to talk to Nikol Pashinyan about how to increase Armenia's security and development. All right, let's wrap up our topics here. Let me ask each of you if there's something on your mind from this past week that you would like to share with us. Tevan, what's on your mind? Again, Artsakh, I think we need to perfectly understand that all the issues changing us with the different artificial agendas and we're sometimes forgetting about the Artsakh. We all permanently need to raise the issue with the Artsakh, speaking about Artsakh as republic, speaking about Artsakh people as with the guys whose rights has been violated, about the genocide and about the, all our historical part that uh, that issue should be permanently on all our Armenian thoughts and ideas and not going with the many, many other artificially sometimes issues like someone made uh, Dikhanovska or something is happening in one place, but really concentrate our all issues towards the issue of Artsakh and perfectly understand that from there, uh, maybe we would really start to think about national unity and national uh, recovery. Yeah, thank you very much for bringing up that, that subject because I believe that in the past week there were two or three hundred Artsakhsis who were actually demonstrating. We haven't had the chance to touch on that. Hovig, um, what's on your mind? Well, um, indeed, I cannot deny that Artsakh is at the top of my mind and always, I think. But, you know, I think it is important to call out a farce when it happens. And the fact that not a single Western diplomat has acknowledged that even one of the sort of pol- political prisoners in Armenia is indeed a political prisoner. I think it's a travesty. I think we need to slap them on their face with it, figuratively speaking, every time that you meet one. The fact is that this regime came to power in 2018 in their coup. Uh, they came to power using some of the most vile insults and language. And uh, the fact that that tables have turned now is, I think, also... I mean, it's a minor thing, but it's justice. And uh, just recently, I think uh, they were deba- there is precedent in Armenian courts now where, you know, when you call someone an SOB, it is um, not insulting someone's mother, but it can be interpreted as political speech. I know this is sad in all the, like, 
totality of things that we have to deal with, but it is just the chickens coming home to roost. I don't like it. Uh, I don't like, you know, using sort of uh, vile language, but I don't think that people should be jailed for it. And um, I think Armenia really should be a dem democracy, but not a fake one that is just, uh, you know, that the European or Western diplomats pay lip service to. All right. Let's leave it there for today then. Thank you, Tevan, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Okay, that was our show for today, recorded on March 25, 2024. Please remember to support us. Go to our donate page, podcasts.groom.org slash donate, and consider buying us a coffee or better yet, become a sustaining member of Groom and give monthly. Thank you in advance. We've been talking with Tevan Boosian, who is the president of the International Center for Human Development. Mr. Boosian was an MP in the National Assembly between 2012 and 2017 from the Heritage Party. From 1997 to 1999, he served as the nagorno arapa Public Affairs Office Director in Washington, D.C. I'm Asbet Bedrosian. And this is Hovik Manucharyan. Please follow us on social media and follow us everywhere you get your Armenian news. The links are in the show notes. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you soon.